his head. God said, I'm doing a work. And I pointed. I said, young man, come down here. And in just a few moments, he fell on his face as the Holy Ghost hit him. He dropped to his knees. And those people, I didn't know what those people had just seen. The Word of God said people are just going to walk in. And that young man just walked in. I'll tell you, I don't know what God's doing, but he's up to something in the earth. And I want to be smack dab in the middle of whatever God's doing. If you want to be a part of what God's doing, just praise him one more time right now. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Amen. So we'll, you'll get to see some of that conference. It, it, God just really blew in there in a mighty way, and we're thankful for that. Uh, so we're glad to be back. Sister Young is very, very sick. Uh, one of our group went sick, and then we just kind of handed it from one to the next. Uh, some of the people went and didn't even get to see one thing in Rome because they were in the hotel room with high fever and vomiting, and it just went from one to the next. And so she got it on the, on the last day, and it hit her, it hit her very hard. So pray for her that she'll be back up soon. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Hallelujah. To everyone, everybody say everyone. everyone. Say not to most, not to, most. Not to some, not to say not to a few, to but to everyone Woo! that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, that means Jew and Gentile alike. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. Well, this is kind of a family church. And uh, we just kind of share joy. We celebrate birthdays. And we we celebrate when people get engaged. And when, when the preacher goes to Rome, he comes home and talks about it. How many want to hear about it? Amen. Notice where I took my text from the book of... <coughs> All right, so you may be seated. I want to talk to you about the gospel and cultural decadence. The gospel and cultural decadence. Amen. Uh, we, we just returned, as I just said, from the city of Rome. It was my first... Uh, time in Rome. I have been to Italy uh, three or four times, but it was the first time that I had been to Rome. Uh, and I wasn't really sure what to expect. Um, I, knew it, it, I knew it would be magnificent. I knew there would be things of extreme interest. Uh, but I wasn't expecting, or I wasn't really knowing what to expect. Uh, but I was excited to go and uh, even excited to go back at some point, and uh, I think out of all the cities, Bishop, that I've been to, uh, Rome may have impacted me uh, in a way uh, related to the Word of God, maybe even uh, in a level equal to Jerusalem, and maybe as I preach today or teach tonight, maybe some of that will come through. Uh, it was grittier than I expected. Uh, Gritty by what I mean. It, it, it's a European city, but it doesn't feel like Paris. It doesn't feel like Rome. It doesn't have the beauty and the raw majesty of some of those places, even though it has beautiful parks. Uh, the best way I can describe Rome to you is that it is a, a city that is 3,000 years old, that is a merging of exquisite beauty with a gritty blue collar feel of working class people that made something great. And uh, it's, it's a very unique place. It has the feel of Jerusalem and even Istanbul. And maybe they all feel alike because they are centers of worship. And uh, you can feel it. It's very unique. I've never been to a city that was like that before. And so I got intrigued very quickly after my arrival. And uh, when we picked our hotel to stay at for the first two days while we were trying to get over jet lag before we moved to the convent, uh, uh, we didn't realize that we were going to be right in the middle of everything. We had just picked a place in, in what we thought was downtown, close to downtown. When we got there, it was right within walking distance of, of literally some of the most important places in history as well as biblical uh, history. And uh, so let me just kind of bring you on the journey of what God spoke to me uh, while I was there. Rome is one of the most important cities of history and culture. It is a place even to this day that reeks of politics, power, economics, education, entertainment, and obviously religion. You name it. It came from Rome. What began 
from that little village, those seven hills begin to develop, and there below, building the mighty forum in the valley that was a swamp, there it became the mighty city that it is today. It grew to become the heart of a mighty empire that would cover most of continental Europe, Britain, West Africa, uh, or Western Asia and North Africa, and even the Mediterranean islands. And over its 3,000 years, it grew from a village to a city, to a kingdom, to a republic, to an empire, and now the seat of the Catholic Church. As one walks the streets of Rome, you can still see the ruins and the remains of what was once the mighty Roman Empire. You can walk through the Colosseum as we did. You can travel around as we did, now in a car instead of a chariot, the Circus Maximus where the mighty chariot races were performed as they raced around the shrines and altars of their false gods. Above it sits Palatine Hill, where the wealthy elite that followed Caesar Augustus and his house that he built, the wealthy would go there. And then just below uh, that Palatine Hill across the Forum is the Maritime Prison, where the Apostle Paul and Peter were both in prison. There you will see those mighty iron legs in Daniel's vision of his great image of how even to this day that strength of Rome can still be seen. You remember the metal man as we call him, Babylon, under the mighty leadership of Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, and then Persia would take over under Cyrus the Great, then to be outdone by Alexander the Great, and then Rome would follow upon their defeat of Greece. There under the leadership of the first Dictator Julius Caesar. I learned a lot. The word dictator actually comes from uh, the Roman term. A dictator was only a dictator for six months. That's why Julius Caesar was assassinated. He was not an emperor. He was simply what they call the first prince. He was appointed as dictator for six months, but then he obviously lasted longer, and it was for that reason they thought that he was trying to establish himself, take Rome back into the area of kings. They didn't want that. And so there at the Temple of Pompeii, where uh, the last night we were there, we ate dinner in a 2,000-year-old room. That's just pretty amazing to be sitting in a room that was 2,000 years old. Just across the way, we saw the very stone where Julius Caesar was assassinated by the senators in the temple of Pompeii, which those pillars where his blood pool are still standing today. And so the ruling empire that was in the position of world domination, uh, Rome was that power in position leading at the time of our New Testament writing. So when you talk about Rome and you look at its might, this was the context, this was the setting of our New Testament. When Jesus was born, there was Roman power in place. When Jesus died, there was Roman power in place. When the epistles were written, Rome, those iron legs, were strongly standing power of Rome is a historical reality. And as you walk the streets of historic Rome, you can still see the magnificence of its artisans, its architects and builders, and even its warriors. Sunday afternoon after church ended, as the sun was going down, we walked across the oldest bridge in existence today. It crosses the Tyler River. It was built 62 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, and it is still standing. This, this shows you the power of their skill and their building and their efforts. It's amazing to stand in places that are 2,500 years old and the stones are still there. We ate dinner in the passageway where maybe even Caesar himself walked into the Argentina temple and the temple of Pompeii, over 2,000 years old. One can walk through the still standing uh, triumphal arch of Titus that was built, commissioned 
after his sacking of Jerusalem in 70 AD, he returned to Jerusalem, bringing with him the wealth that he had pillaged from Jerusalem. I found out some very interesting things as we listened to the guides and read the books. Uh, the Hebrew people, he took back from Jerusalem. Remember when Jesus wept over Jerusalem, he was weeping over. They had not known the day of his visitation. They had rejected their Messiah, and he warned them about the destruction. And in 70 AD, Titus would roll in, the general would roll into Jerusalem and would destroy it, tear down the temple. He would destroy it, and he would take 150,000 Jews back to Rome with him. It was those Jews that would build the Colosseum. It was the literal money from the gold and the silver and the tapestries and the valuable instruments of the holy place of God that was sold and given and, and made to be the very funding of the Colosseum. And that was one of the reasons that the Christians would never go to the gladiator games or go to the places of sport because they knew that the new temple of worship where gladiators fought and Christians would later die. It was there. It had been built upon the back of Jewish slaves and the very temple devoted to God was the means of building their games. Well, I can preach about that a lot. I'm preaching about the gospel and cultural decadence. Rome was once the most powerful place on planet Earth. And our history classes and the novels that we read and even the Hollywood movies have romanticized Rome with its toga parties and its beautiful architecture and romantic gladiators fighting for freedom under Hollywood lights. We've made it a beautiful thing. But if you had lived in the time where they really fought and where the iron legs of Rome stood strong, it would have been extremely challenging to be a Christian. I learned about Rome in a new dimension over the last few days. Rome was at the time of the Apostle Paul. Rome was the first truly multicultural urban metropolitan area. Over one million people lived next to the Tiber River in what was a bustling cultural center. Rome was the conquering empire. There had never been a nation quite like Rome. Yes, there had been others that were more exquisite, more learned, more uh, powerful. There was no head like Nebuchadnezzar, obviously, but he didn't have an army that would compare to Rome because of technology and advancements and that the learning of the Roman system of fighting would take new territories that would be unequal. It didn't have the value of the golden head. It was simply iron, just indicating strength. And yes, with its cruel strength, Rome would bend the world to its wishes. Rome conquered the empire, conquered the world and made it its empire, all the while raping and pillaging. It was unlike Cyrus. Cyrus was called by God, my servant. Cyrus had come, yes, with a strong hand, but immediately upon conquering the people, he would release them to run their own government. He would release them and would allow their language to remain. He would allow them to hold their culture and he would make them massive kings, but not Rome. Rome dominated and pressed down with hot iron and with a whip and with chains, forcing them into slavery. It was not the exquisite nature of Nebuchadnezzar, neither was it the gentle hand of Cyrus ruling from a distance, but Rome was dominion. Rome was heat. Rome was anger. Rome was strength. And it brought slaves from every part that it conquered, and it brought them back to the city, and it became a melting pot of culture and prisoners and decadence and violence. They learned that in Rome you could be free, even if a slave or even if a criminal, if you could get enough money. So money became the end of all things. And you could win your freedom if you could fight your way through the gladiatorial process. And at any time, there would be a thousand to two thousand in one particular training center for the gladiators. Though it was a republic, it was not a simple republic. It was really an oligarchy where the elite class held the voting rights and the ability to bear arms well while they kept the poorer people unarmed and at bay. So those that had the weapons were able to control the government. And so here it was, this oligarchy ruled with 
the high class living on Palatine and Capitol Hill, where below in the lower swampy areas were those that were kept to do the bidding of the wealthy. There came a plethora of cultures that brought a variety of gods and worship from their different backgrounds and different nations. Rome had its own in the mix. It was known as the cult of Rome. And the highest of the priests was called the Pontifus Maximus. He was the highest priest of the Roman cult. And the remains of that can be seen in what is known as the Pantheon, the temple to the gods. It is the most copied building in the world. If you were to go to many, in fact, our own state capital is a direct copy of the dome of the Pantheon. You go to Monticello where uh, Thomas Jefferson's house, it is almost an exact duplicate of the Pantheon. The Pantheon is still to this day the largest unsupported dome structure that has ever been built. It is the most preserved building of an antiquity anywhere on planet Earth. It is exquisite, it is beautiful. And as you walk in, you look at that huge dome bigger than this room. Huge, unending dome that moves that was built to represent the pantheon of all of the different gods that the cult of Rome uh, worshipped. And with its pontifus maximus, as they worship not only these gods, but whatever god you had, you could put into the pantheon of the cult of Rome. The remains of such can still be seen as their polytheistic worship was so much a part of their culture. There were many that bore the title emperor throughout history, but really there were only 12 that were the most effective, are those even worth remembering. Julius Caesar, known often by most as the first emperor, was not in fact an emperor. Uh, the real emperor began with the second one that at this time of the year we often call his name he was born and named Octavian, but he took the name of Caesar Augustus, or Caesar the Revere. He was the first, and then would follow Tiberius, Caligula, and Claudius, and Nero. These five, along with Julius Caesar, are considered the most important of the Caesars because it was then, during their reign, that the things that happened affected so much of human history. These five or six rulers brought decadence and perversion in disturbing proportion. I don't know what idea you have from a Hollywood set. I don't know what uh, continental novel you read about the Emperor series as I did many years ago. And I don't know what idea you have of the gladiators and their cool swords. But understand something. That was an ugly, decadent, vile culture. And as I listened to the guys who read the books and went from place to place, I just felt a burden because there's a part of what we do that is based out of history, our biblical history, that sometimes you've got to go back and understand what kind of environment the Apostle Paul was preaching in. You gotta understand what kind of context they were having church in. It, it wasn't easy, it wasn't air conditioned buildings, it, it wasn't just, you know, have a good dinner with your family and then show up at church. The, these people were going to church and having places of worship in very difficult circumstances. And if I can, and I'm going to have to be careful because there are things I heard guides say this week and things that I read that I couldn't even say in mixed company, much less in a house of worship like this that describe the people that this is stuff they never told us in our classroom in school. I want to take the cover off of the historical narrative of your idea of romantic Rome. And I want to show you in just a few words tonight what Rome was really like. Julius Caesar is viewed historically as a tremendous leader and a warrior. The more I learned from the Romans this week, talking about their own Roman heroes, they would tell you unabashedly he was an immoral man. He was known for his flash dress, and his flash dress and his wealthy position caught the eye of the homosexual king of Bithynia. And at his invitation, Julius Caesar would share the bed of the king of Bithynia as his male lover for several months. And then he would 
immorality. Rome was an ugly and a dangerous and perverted place. Many of the slaves, as I listened this week, were sex slaves that were brought to Rome, taken for no other reason than the pleasure of their captors. Pornography, you say pornography, they didn't have a printing press, they didn't have the internet, they didn't need it, they had artisans that could carve and could mold. Many of the slaves were sex slaves. Pornography was rampant, even you can see today, on the coins that were made by the government. Pornography was stamped and pressed into the coins. On one side would be the magistrate, and on the back would be their favorite sexual perversions. This was their economy. Gravestones that remain to this day, the epitaphs on the gravestones, instead of talking of their accomplishments, rather they would often describe their sexual taste or fetish or the accomplishments of that deceased forever to live on the epitaph, their sexual escapades. This wasn't a gentle, kind community. This was moral decadence. The legal age one could take a boy child to be your lover was age 12. Unless they were a slave, then there was no age minimum. You had no rights. You were simply a product to be used. There were even fertility festivals. Many of these temples were built not to worship God, but rather to fulfill their lust. Infanticide, the children, killing of children, had become so common that the birth of a daughter, listen to this, the birth of a daughter, it was not a crime to throw your girl away. They didn't even want to have girl children. It was not a crime. A child, a boy, was worth a little more because he could become a warrior for the government, or you could take your child and give her to the brothel upon birth, and she could be used because she was of little value except her body. Kill her soul. Then, I can't even describe the perverted justice. As I read this week in horrifying detail, of when people were convicted of crimes, the judges would rule what could be done to them physically that were of sexual perversion that would boggle with your mind. They got so perverted they brushed their teeth with human urine. Decadent beyond anything you can even imagine. Rulers and magistrates so debauched, so vile, so filthy. Violence just as the wisest man would say, the eye is never satisfied with seeing, the ear is never satisfied with hearing. You, you can't fulfill the lust of the flesh and never get fulfilled. It's always going to lead to moral decay further and further. And for that's why you better be careful, young people, about what you start watching. Because your eye will never be satisfied. What turned you on when you were 10 won't turn you on at 40. It'll get worse and you'll wind up doing and pursuing things that you would be embarrassed anybody even knew. And this was the way the Roman culture had gotten, but it was no longer an embarrassment because it was so open, so, so uh, being propagated around the nation that it was open to all of them. Just a normal everyday thing until violence was simply the next step. Not only sadomasochism, but violence in itself became normal. Death became a blood sport. The first gladiator games had to do with the river sticks and death. There was a man of wealth that died, but they didn't want to cross the river alone. Some of those ideas that you hear people talk about, even in gospel songs, 
was the idea come out of old mythology of the river Styx that you were going to have to cross the river Styx, which, which led to hell. And so you didn't want to go. You wanted to take someone with you. And so as that, that wealthy elder died, they took ten of his servants and put them, not knowing what was going to happen, in a round pen and dropped ten warriors in. And those ten warriors killed those ten slaves so that that, that elite leader didn't have to cross alone. Thus the beginning of what would become the gladiator games. Even the games started with spiritual significance. Even the Circus Maximus, they were racing the southeast turn where the chariots would make that big, remember Ben Hur's story, as, as that, that big crash at the end of that turn. That was literally around a god, a shrine that was built to the altar of one of their cult of Rome gods. Even their sports was related to the spirit realm. Gladiator games became more than victors and losers, but to lose meant you lost your life. But you didn't just lose your life, the crowd wanted to see you die. So as a result, the gladiators began to be paid high money. And a first time unknown gladiator would be paid for first appearance three times the yearly salary of the average man working in Rome. <coughs> Grand dramas and plays were played out in the Colosseum, the Circus Maximus, and other theaters, where criminals were forced to play the roles of the villain in which they would die, not just in the play, they would literally die while playing the part because the audience wanted to be amused by the death of real-time action. Children were killed to honor the goddess Mania, which meant chaos and confusion from which we get our word maniac. The feast of Lupercalia, where magistrates and young men would run naked through the streets with whips covered in the blood from the sacrifices, and men and women would line the streets to be whipped by these naked runners. But one such celebration that Julius Caesar set and watched rose to walk into the temple of Pompeii where he was killed. And the roots of that celebration became known as Valentine's Day. The festival of Saturnalia, which was baking and cooking, where they chose from the people a young child, a boy child, that would be the king, the mock king for the celebration. That little boy would be chosen as all the baking and the cooking and the celebration and the singing of songs and at the of the day the mock, mock king was killed, and that celebration was on December the 25th. The Roman sword was the means of the Pax Romana, which meant Roman peace. It wasn't peace as in the end of war, but it was peace rather as Rome removed every ability you had to fight her iron. It was a place where violence and perversion walked hand in Visible signs of violence and perversion and immorality can still be seen and felt 2,000 years ago. I was shocked as I walked through the Vatican, through the Sistine Chapel. I'm not denigrating anyone, please don't misunderstand. But at times it was embarrassing to be in mixed company in what was supposed to be a church. It's the leftovers of a decadent cultural line, what is supposed to be a house of worship. is everywhere you look, on scenes are naked people. And statues of naked people in a place called worship. Rome was dangerous, corrupt, decadent, and immoral. Why am I talking? Because Paul wanted to go there. And as I walked through the Colosseum and I looked at the Maritime time prison where Paul was, and I looked at all of the stuff and I read about the debauchery and the immorality, I thought, my God, who, who in their right mind would want to come to this crazy place? And then I took out my Bible and I looked for Paul. He, he, he just couldn't get away from it. He, he could have got out of it, but he, he appealed to a I got it. 
he became close, closely acquainted with Priscilla and Aquila. Remember Priscilla and Aquila? <coughs> he met them. How did he meet them? He met them. Your Bible tells you that, that he met them because they were part of those that had to flee Rome when Claudius was the emperor. Claudius had expelled all the Jews in the year 49 AD. There had got to be such a fight. There had got to be such a, an issue because between the Jewish believers and, and uh, the, the people that were in the church, they were fighting over, over this, this whatever it was. And there's the debate about that. I don't have time to get into all of that. But evidently it caused such a ruckus. And uh, for whatever reason, Claudius, who other than that had been a, a pretty decent guy, yes, as far as building and leading, but he expelled all the Jews. And so Priscilla and Aquila, who were from Rome, wound up having to flee. And it was there in Acts chapter 18 that it tells us that they were part of that diaspora that had had to leave. So Paul knew of the condition that Priscilla and Aquila had had to flee from. But in spite of knowing about the decadence of that evil culture, he still wanted to go there. Acts chapter 11, you remember the story of Agnes prophesied that there would be a famine. There were in fact four famines that in the reign of uh, Claudia, it so devastated. It was for that reason that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas had to make those missionary journeys as they would deliver the offerings to the people that didn't have uh, anything to eat or didn't have enough to survive. Claudius would die in the year 54 AD. He was poisoned by his wife who gave him some of those wonderful Italian mushrooms. Think twice before you eat them the next time that you wipe your bear. His stepson that he had adopted at uh, the convincing of his wife was a young man by the name of Nero who became the emperor at age 16. He was not learned enough, and so he sat under the tutors, one, three of them in particular, but the one that's most notable that you know the name is Seneca. Seneca was the leader of philosophy of Rome of that day. He is still considered today to be one of the greatest Stoics that ever lived. And so he had a strong hand upon the early years of uh, uh, of Nero's rulership. So he was able to keep him somewhat contained. But but really, uh, he wasn't that good of a young man. He had issues that were deep. And, and he wasn't learned enough. But in that first five years with Seneca's hand upon him, there was a sense of moderation that had come back. And so many of the Jews that had fled under Claudius were able to return. So during four or five years there, maybe even as many as six, many of the Jews came back. Understand, this is important to know when you read your book of Romans. That's what Paul is having to deal with. Get the picture. When Claudius kicked everybody out, this is, this is Bible history 101 right here. When Claudius kicked all the Jews out, all the ethnic Jews, get them out of here, he kicked them out. Well, remember, at that time, there was still the, pro the primary group in the church was Jewish converts. And we know that as early as 41 AD, uh, there was already a church in Rome. So the majority of the church in Rome was still Jewish when they were expelled by Claudius. Are y'all interested in this? My born in death. They were kicked out. So they had been the majority of the church. Maybe there had been a handful. We don't really know, but we know the majority of the Roman church was Jewish. They're kicked out. All that's left of the church is the handful of Gentile believers. So over the four to six years, Rome began to have revival. The church in Rome began to have revival, but it wasn't among Jews because they were gone, and the church became largely Gentiles. When Nero, the first five years, is in power, there's moderation. The Jews come back. The Jewish believers come back, and when they get back to Rome, they're no longer in charge. And so now there's conflict because the Jewish believers are coming into a primarily dominated position by Gentile believers, and that's where you see the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome. He's dealing with those issues that, that he's trying to help them negotiate through that difficulty. The Judaizers are trying to come in and turn uh, the, the Gentile Christians into Jewishness and the law back. And so he's dealing with all that. That's, that's a little light and showing you how the power of Rome even affected the scripture that you read. So, when the Jews left, that they had been in power, now they returned, and it's all. So Paul knew not only about the violence, he knew not only about the, the perversion in the city, but he also knew about the struggle that was going on in the congregation. But don't miss it, he still wanted to go. No matter how bad it looked, no matter how bad the culture was, no matter how decadent the magistrates and the rulers were, he was not afraid to minister. Romans chapter 8 and 35. 
He said these words, who shall separate us from the love of God? Notice, I hope it comes alive now when you hear it. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Verse 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall ever separate us from the love of God. It don't matter how perverted the ruler is. It doesn't matter how decadent the society is. It don't matter how many swords they bring out or how many slaves they seduce. There is a power that is greater
Paul appealed to Agrippa. He said, let me go defend myself in Rome. He knew his rights as a Roman citizen because he was born free in Tarsus. He winds up in Rome, Maritime Prison. Friday afternoon, I climbed up Capitol Hill and I looked down. I couldn't get in because the roof caved in. They have to do repairs, so I couldn't get in to look at the hole. But I looked at where it was. It was there that the Apostle Paul was taken prisoner. There in what is now the basement floor of the church. And it would drop him down that hole, and history says that they had to change the guard every 15 minutes because if they let him stay there longer, they'd get converted to his faith. Man, that's a, that's a soul winning dude right there. And it was from that place that he would write what we call, scholars call the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. He wrote them between 60 and 62 AD. Nero's mentor, Seneca, had died, and Nero was pretty much a punk. I'd like to just slap him. <laughs> he was a punk before he ever did all that burning stuff. We found out this week that when he was a teenager, even while he had his mentor, Seneca, helping him, and his, you know, he was a teenager, I mean, he's one of those typical, well, never mind, but he's just a punk. He would dress up and disguise himself so nobody knew it was Nero. You know, the emperor's stepson. He'd give his friends and he'd go through the community, he'd bash in windows and pick people out of the street, and beat them up, and, and then they'd call the authorities, people would come and get him, and he'd take his rope off before all the soldiers came to arrest him. They'd have to bow low pieces. That's a punk. He's a punk. But you never say he's a punk. Wouldn't you just like to slap him? I guess that was an indication, but when Seneca was gone, it went from being teenage vandalism and cruelty. His cruelty and perversion and wickedness went unchecked. So remember the mighty fire that hit? And some say he started. Who knows? But while his city that he's supposed to be in charge of burned, he sang. He accused the Christians of burning Rome. That was his excuse because now the moderation was over. He began to unleash persecution and in spite of what your professors tell you, go to Rome, they tell you the truth. The majority of Rome was behind him. In fact, for many, many years, they still celebrated him even after he was gone. He had offended the elite, so the elite had him assassinated, but the populace were behind him. <coughs> and he began to persecute Christians, and he would crucify them and take their bodies crucified them around the Circus Maximus, which was, which was the largest horse chair racetrack, which most people think most Christians died in the Colosseum. They didn't. Most of them died at the Circus Maximus, which set 150,000 people. He lined the crucified bodies of Christians around the Circus Maximus and then offered a new opportunity for night racing by lighting the bodies of the Christians that were crucified around the track and they raced as the bodies of the Christians were burned. It was this emperor that would execute the Apostle Paul as well as Peter. Evil, perversions, wickedness, violence, danger, botchery, decadence. But from his prison cell, Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 12, but I wish ye should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. I don't think you've got that. One place he said unto the household at Caesar's house. He understood that whatever I got to go through, I got to get to Rome. I'm not ignorant. And before it was over, the gospel had got into the very palace of Caesar. Whatever I got to go through, I'm going to get the gospel. And it made its way all the way into the palace of Nero. So that my bonds in Christ, everybody say in Christ. Shout in Christ. You're not shouting, you're saying, I need you to shout and say in Christ. He said, there are manifest in all the palace and in other 
Look at 128. I love this. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. He knew about Rome. He knew about their perversion. He knew about their cruelty. In fact, he would die himself. But he said, in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Which is to them an evident token of perdition. But to you salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ. Not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which he saw in me. And now I'm here to be in me. In other words, you just endure it. And God is going to use it to break the backbone of this evil empire. The apostle Paul saw himself not as a prisoner of Rome. He saw himself on an undercover mission by God. What would happen if you quit whining about your problems? What would happen if you put fear back in the closet and you said, God, whatever I got to go through, bring it on, devil. I'm a child of God. I'm bigger, better. I got the Holy Ghost in me. And God, you're going to get the glory out of this thing. Why don't you never say quit whining and start fighting? He wanted the Roman church. I'm almost done. Musicians come. He wanted them to listen loud and clear. Just kidding. That this urban church in the middle of a carnal, vile community. And that's what I felt the Holy Ghost tell me while I was in Rome and on the way home and, and today. Rock Church, the day of intimidation is absolutely over.
spite of it, he said, to Philemon, he said, I'm a prisoner, not of Rome, not a Negro. All right. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, he said. I've been sent here by God. So you put me in a cell, I'll win the guard. You give me a pen and a piece of paper, I'll turn the world upside down with some epistles. And 2,000 years later, your bridge may be still standing, but my epistles still going to be rolling. And they're going to be preaching about it in Sacramento. And somebody's going to hear about my struggle. And they're going to get paid for their struggle. And if you pay much attention, you don't even have to go to the deep web to find out how decadent our society's getting.
It said it'd be like somebody in the audience, it's like an illumination goes off, and the Holy Ghost says zero in the middle. It's like a, he said it's like a channel of, of light. And he said, just start preaching. That's like something I'll That's what Brother Wilson's doing sometime. You just think he's preaching everybody, but he's zero in on one soul, and the Holy Ghost is illuminating him. It's like a light, a channel of light, just, and the love of God's flowing to him. I want you to do that with 